Uh, welcome everyone to our third SNARL seminar. Um, I just want to let you know that I am not at Valentine or SNARL right now. We are camping in Colorado and uh, I am broadcasting to you from a campground in Colorado. So hopefully our internet stays good here. Um, but uh, it was the first time I got to see my family since before COVID started, because now everybody's vaccinated. So we, we made a journey for Mother's Day, got to see my mom and um, we're on our way back now. So the, the magic of internet is allowing us to do this from anywhere nowadays. So I hope everything goes well. Um, and I just wanted to uh, let you all know that we do still have a few spaces in our outdoor science education programs, which will be running at Valentine this summer. So if you have kids or grandkids or neighbors or friends that would like to participate, um, please go to our website and take a look and see what's open. And we'd love to have you guys all participating in those programs this summer. So today, um, it is my great pleasure to welcome our speaker today, Tim Brown. And uh, Tim is a grad student who's been working with us for several years now. Tim is in his uh, third year, I believe, Tim, yeah, um, year. Of, a, of a PhD program at UC Santa Cruz. And so Tim has been um, the recipient of multiple uh, awards, one through the Valentine Eastern Sierra Reserves and one through the Matthias Awards Program for his research that he's been conducting in the High Sierra. And the focus of his work is looking at rosy finches and rosy finches are one of the highest elevation breeding birds in the world, which makes them, I think, one of my favorite birds. Um, it's neck and neck with the, uh, the oyster catcher. But um, that's also a cool bird, but I do really appreciate the rosy finches. And um, Tim is gonna be talking about his thesis work with the rosy finches and sort of how things are progressing with his work, where he is and what he's finding so far. I also wanted to mention that um, one of the other uh, kind of cool aspects about Tim and his work is that he involves a whole lot of undergraduates in his work. And so every year, Tim comes to Snarl or Valentine and brings a cadre of students um, from the Camino program at UC Santa Cruz and the Doris Duke Conservation Scholars program at Santa Cruz. And a lot of these students have really never spent much time um, doing this sort of work, number one, and uh, number two, hiking up to these high elevation sites. And so they're, they're getting kind of a crash course not only in science, but in uh, in sort of the rigors of camping and backpacking and remote field work. And, um, and I have to say that all the students I've met are exceptional and they're just really stoked to be out there. And so Tim is a great mentor and uh, it's just, it's really wonderful to see him providing those opportunities for these young students, um, as well as doing a lot of really interesting work. So. Today, Tim is gonna be talking about assessing climate variability in the highest elevation breeding birds on the continent, North America's rosy finches. All right, Tim, and I'll let you take All right. it away. All right, let's share my screen here. How does that work? Can you see my full slides? Hopefully. Yeah, that's great. Great. Well, thanks, Carol, uh, for that introduction. Um, I am speaking to you from um, kind of a foreign habitat, a lab space in Santa Cruz. Um, as a field ecologist, I spend very little time in the lab, but um, it does have the best Wi-Fi connection and very little distractions um, at, this, at this hour uh, compared to my house in COVID time. So um, yeah, so as Carol mentioned, I am a third year PhD student and uh, my talk today is going to be basically covering what I've been up to, what I'm researching, and kind of go through uh, exactly uh, a little bit about what I found, but mostly kind of where I'm going. Um, I still have a couple more years of research and uh, this is a way to kind of tell a story about a system that I, I care very much about and um, I think is, is pretty unique and pretty neat. So. <clears throat> Um, let's start it off, the alpine ecosystem. So 
Alpine ecosystems are classically defined as those communities occurring above elevation of uh, tree line. Um, Alpine ecosystems provide severe physiological stressors for both animal and plant populations um, that has resulted in really cool, unique species, uh, many of which are endemic uh, to the spaces. Globally, Alpine ecosystems only cover about 3% of the world's land area. However, functionally, they are a critical environment that store water in the form of snow. And uh, as we know, snowpack has directional downslope implications that uh, have a variety of other, that have a variety of impacts to other organisms and habitats. Um, and the greatest area of alpine ecosystems in California occurs in the Sierra Nevada, which is uh, mostly where I work. Um, Human-induced climate change represents a particular challenge for high elevation biodiversity. Climate change disproportionately threatens alpine species by reducing available habitat and isolating their populations. So the argument that organisms close to the limits of their physiological tolerances may be particularly susceptible to environment change remains pretty robust. And it is well documented that high latitude, high altitude ecosystems will be especially responsive to climactic changes in the coming decades. And here you see uh, several uh, species that you're probably familiar with that are either obligate alpine species or uh, breed and make a living in uh, alpine environments here in the Sierra Nevada. I say here, but there maybe in the Sierra Nevada. So the distribution of uh, ecology of alpine ecosystems is governed by uh, really cold climactic conditions at high elevations. Um, thus climate change poses a disproportionate risk to alpine ecosystems because they're determined by these relatively strict climactic parameters. The major changes in climate are characterized by increases in temperatures and precipitation patterns and often an increase in frequency and intensity of extreme climactic events, something um, we've been experiencing a lot lately, I think in the last few summers, as we know of the fires in California. As a result, changes in climactic parameters have a strong impact on the, on the physical environment. Um, ones that I'll be talking about today are reduced snowpack and increasing uh, drought frequency, both key attributes to an alpine uh, habitat. And alpine regions and the species that in inhibit them are dependent on and are defined by these climactic conditions and they vary along elevational gradients. As a result, mount uh, montane alpine species are at risk due to narrow elevational bands inherent in these alpine environments. So mountaintop animals are among probably the most vulnerable species to climate change. Um, if warming forces them upwards, they face an escalator to extinction as they reach the upper elevational limits of available habitat. I think this graphic depicts that phenomenon pretty clearly and shows an example of a habitat range shift in an upward elevational gradient where species seeking cooler temperatures over time move to the top. This ultimately results in the mountaintop specialist, the one being the one on top, being pushed off and extirpated from its range and sometimes entirely extinct. So understanding the mechanisms that limit these extreme environment specialists and their responses to variation is fundamental to anticipating conservation threats and needs. In California, the Sierra Nevada experiences a Mediterranean climate with dry summers and cool wet winters where precipitation is characterized by punctuated storms in usually October through April. These Mediterranean climates are changing. Precipitation that has historically fallen as snow in these high elevations is increasingly falling as rain. This figure I think is a, is a nice one and it shows the future trajectory or a possible future trajectory of where the ratio of precipitation fallen as snow occurs at a narrower elevational band and a much smaller geographic surface area. So these are some satellite images of the central and southern Sierra. You can see the green, uh, predominant green lake there is Mono Lake for reference. Um, and these are taken during the three years of uh, my project. I uh, started in 2018 as a pilot season, and then uh, the project really kicked off in 2019 and last year in 2020. Um, these images show an average snow year in 2018, 
And you can see in 2019 when we had a above average snow year. And then last year we had a, a low snow year. And this is looking like this year is gonna be even lower than, that, than uh, last year. All these photos are taken in June. And June is when we, when we begin collecting data. And it also marks um, from a climactic perspective, the definitive end of, of the snowfall for that year. And the beginning of the breeding period for rosy finches. So uh, the Sierra Nevada Great Crown Rosy Finch is the species that I study. Um, it's confined to California, Sierra Nevada and White Mountains. You can see here the total range in this picture depicts uh, the range of gray crowned rosy finch um, species. The Sierra Nevada rosy finch is a subspecies and you can see that it actually occupies the southernmost um, part of the range, the southernmost latitude part and a very narrow distribution, that small purple feature in California on the border of Nevada there. So why study rosy finches? Um, well, they're one of the least studies, studied birds in North America. So that besides that being a cool thing um, to want to know more about, um, they are also a mountaintop species. They breed in extreme environments that may be subject to directional climate change. And understanding factors that determine species persistence in the face of rapid environmental change is sort of central, is one of the central goals to ecology and evolutionary biology. Rosy finches are generalists. So in order to know if it is in fact vulnerable to climate change, we need to understand where its margins are in the alpine. And as a generalist, there are a variety of ways it may respond to environmental change. For example, rosy finches eat a variety of things. So if there is a negative effect to their food source, does that mean that they are more vulnerable because they have an effect on one of their food resources being unavailable? and how that might impact their ability to breed. Or as a generalist, they might, they, they might be more robust and they might actually just switch prey sources and eat something else. So as a generalist, you kind of don't know what you're getting. Also birds are particularly good indicators of change in terrestrial ecosystems. Um, they have high body temperatures, rapid metabolism and prominent positions in the food web make them good indicators for local and regional ecosystem change. And as a generalist, rosy finches can be a good integrator to understand species responses when they may be close to their effective ecological edge. So my research specifically uh, focuses on developing an integrated understanding of ecological factors that are important for the persistence of this high altitude songbird. Um, habitat constraints on breeding distribution are likely to include cross-scale factors with varying sensitivity to environmental change. Traits that are important to rosy finches, um, persistent, that are, make them persistent in extreme alpine habitats, such as food availability and timing, could respond strongly on climate through changing hydrology in the form of snowpack, snow melt, and summer rainfall, and its effects on plant and arthropod production and detectability. So this is kind of my roadmap, um, what I'm gonna be talking about. Uh, my talk is centered around these specific questions. How many rosy finches are there in both the Sierra and the White Mountains? Is kind of what I'm, I first wanna find out. Secondly, where are they? And not, and what, sorry, where are they? And what determines their breeding distribution and densities? And I don't just mean the outline distribution or the blob on a map, but what are the mechanisms that promote or hinder their ability to successfully breed throughout the range? And then finally, how reliant are they on snowpack for the breeding season? And how does this vary contrasting, how does this vary in contrasting parts of their distribution? And by contrasting parts of their distribution, I mean uh, the Sierra versus the White Mountains, which are if you're familiar with the area, are very different mountain ranges that both have alpine habitats. So the first two questions, I'm gonna I'm gonna start out by telling you about these two pieces together, so I can walk through walk you through the questions and my specific approach to collecting data. The two questions, <clears throat> questions one and two, are kind of fundamental questions of biology for any species. Currently, there is not an estimated population of rosy finches in California. 
So my, my aim is to find out the population of rosy finches and where they are and what determines their densities. In order to do that, I am working on identifying the environmental factors that constrain rosy finches to these high elevation breeding sites. And eventually developing a model that incorporates landscape scale spatial distributions of breeding rosy finches relative to the attributes of the alpine environment where we find them. So what do we know? Um, there has been previous observations made, although they were a long time ago. Uh, Joseph Grinnell, an organismal biologist in California, many of you may know, uh, made some observations and came up with this kind of coarse distribution of Sierra Nevada rosy finches in 1944. You can see that there are only a small number of observations made in only a few locations in the central and southern Sierra. The Sierra shown in red and the White Mountains shown in blue. And in order to de determine a population, you need to know where to look. And looking is the first step. What we don't know is the population of rosy finches. And in order to answer that, I have to get at my second question first. So the second question as a reminder is what determines their breeding distribution and densities? And my hypothesis is that at these high elevation breeding sites, cliff nesting, the actual cliff nesting sites, snowpack, and the availability of food all co-limit rosy finch breeding habit, which means that neither one of those attributes directly affects it. It's the combination of these alpine features that are having an effect on uh, their densities and distribution. So the study area <clears throat> that I have, you can see here, this is a map of um, the Sierra Nevada in purple, and that's the entire range, the 400 mile long range. And in the black there is the distribution that I showed you from the previous map uh, generated by Grinnell in 1944. So my study area encompasses the high elevation sites, mostly along the Eastern slope of the Sierra and, and east across the large basin to the White Mountains. So for my study design, I'm taking a systematic approach. Um, I've established habitat predictions. So what you see in this map is the blob of pixelated colors, um, the browns, the, the, the brown in, in total is, uh, represents four by four kilometer blocks that make up the total study area that I'm looking at. So that's generated based on these attributes. Um, it's pretty coarse, but it's based on these attributes of elevation, aspect, and slope and NDVI, which is a level of greenness uh, measuring <clears throat> plant food sources. So what I did here was uh, determine what their distribution is coarsely. And then these blocks, I ranked these blocks based on uh, those habitat variables that I just mentioned. And then these blocks were randomly sampled. So first with a random, first I did a random pass. And then I had to stratify to include a few things. One is the margins. So where do they exist at their extremities? So in the north and in the southern range. Um, and then, of course, I needed to add in um, accessibility because a random pass and generating a random pass of, of sampling design put me in locations that were completely inaccessible. So I had to account for accessibility. Not all the places, not all these places are easy to access on foot. And as Carol mentioned before, um, I have a team of interns and I really couldn't do that, this work without them. So I'm, I'm gonna um, take a moment to talk about the crew. Um, so every year I mentor um, four students um, from generally from underrepresented communities that are part of these programs that are based out of Santa Cruz, Camino and Doris Duke. Um, and as Carol mentioned, these students um, have almost no experience. So this is a first time for everything. Um, most of the students uh, have never camped before, have never uh, even car camped of any kind, pitched a tent. So not only are these students kind of coming out and taking this large endeavor of doing um, science in the Alpine at these high elevation sites, but they're also learning all the skills that are required to move through the mountains. So it's a, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty steep learning curve, um, but I find, and I think Carol has seen that it's a pretty um, rewarding experience for these students and, um, it's pretty awesome actually to be able to go out and and mentor and teach these students uh, not only science but also some of these some of these life skills. 
Um, okay, so getting back to the study. So uh, knowing when to go is part of it and knowing a little bit about the life history of the Rosie Finch in order to kind of pin down um, some of these questions. So Rosie finches occur at these high elevations. Their nest sites are generally high up in alpine cliffs. They're cavity nesters. Um, depending, on, uh, depending on the snow and the weather, the precipitation of the year, they usually come in in early, late May, early June. Um, they have these really narrow breeding windows of about eight weeks. So as a result, they only have a single clutch, usually three to four birds. And uh, importantly, they are central place, forager, for, central place foragers. Um, and why that matters is they don't travel very far um, to forage. So that has uh, some implications into some of the hypotheses that I've generated. So some of my, some of my objectives with these block surveys are to, like I said, generate the overall density and the population density for the species and characterize the habitat, which I need to do first in order to get a population estimate. Um, so in these blocks, these four by four by four kilometer blocks are, are pretty big blocks. And you can imagine they vary a ton. So these blocks have forests in them, they have rock, they have snow, they have ice, they have all these different variables. So you really got to break the block down. And for that reason, I chose to do point counts along a transect. Um, and the reason I did this is that point counts are get at really understanding the habitat needs of these birds at a local scale and how density might vary at that very local scale. And you can see here on the on the screen, that's just a, a mock-up of a transect, but pretty similar um, to one what one might look like. So um, that doesn't look like a straight line um, here. But that generally is a straight line transect for 200 for uh, two kilometers with points uh, varying in between eight points varying in between in which we do these surveys. And the idea here is to take the occurrence and <clears throat> uh, determine the density at each one of these points and then relate that and those habitat characteristics to the entire area as a whole. So this is what a actual transect looks like. Um, this is Ritter and Banner area, and this is one of the transects that we've established. And uh, you can see that uh, it's mostly a straight line here. Um, we kind of get to a site and every <clears throat> 250 meters, we have these points spread out where we do uh, our surveys. And you can see that we go across all terrain. Essentially, the idea is to walk in a straight line, um, with nothing to terrain you until it's essentially unsafe as to, as to, as to generate a non-bias uh, sample. So it can get pretty tricky at times. Um, and so an alpine transect, this is an actual alpine transect. Um, it's two kilometers long with 250 meter intervals. So there's eight points along the line. So estimating occurrence of bird density from these point counts, what we do is we take data from the point counts and they're recorded as a list of birds seen or heard and an estimation of distance using a laser rangefinder to each one of these birds from the observer. Uh, many of the transects that we've surveyed, we did multiple years and some were surveyed multiple times within a year. Along the transect, we performed these seven minute point count surveys for all avian species by sight and sound. So in order to determine whether a rosy finch is just passing through or likely is actually breeding there or within the radius, we do the survey transect twice. So generally we run the transect, we walk it, and within the same 24 hour period, we either walk it back or we walk it again to make sure that the, the birds that are there are actually breeding there. Um, at each point, a GPS point is taken. We take some environmental variables, elevation, temperature, wind speed, and such. And then we record uh, the distance and direction to uh, alpine features that uh, are important for rosy finches. So to cliffs, um, distance and direction to cliffs as a proxy for nesting sites, snow and water, both proxies for foraging resources. Um, snow directly, uh, insects off of snow and also um, seeds. And then water, uh, we have uh, mayflies and other macroinvertebrates that, um, that rosy finches eat on. 
Additionally, wherever we see a rosy finch, we do the same thing. And we take distance and direction variables to those alpine features, as well as a GPS point of where that rosy finch is relative to the, the point we are at. So additionally, um, at each one of these points, we characterize the habitat. This is done by surveying a 50 meter radius. At each one of these points, we estimate the percent cover of a variety of habitat variables, including bare ground, talus and scree, snow, tundra, and different types of vegetation. We also record the presence and estimate the cover of conifers. Um, and conifers are generally only found in the first few hundred meters of a transect and are important to measure as they represent tree line or the transition from subalpine to alpine ecosystems. And further, woody vegetation may be an environmental variable that causes a mechanistic constraint on breeding in the form of competition from other species uh, um, and potentially predation. So you can see these are the sample, these are the completed blocks in 2018 and um, 2018 through 2020. And this is kind of the same range that I've been showing you from the satellite imagery to the distribution map. Um, and you can see that uh, I've tried to sample across an equal distribution in a systematic way. And we've gone as far as uh, Friel Peak in the Tahoe Rim, which is the uh, Friel Peak is the tallest peak in uh, Tahoe in the north, which is considered uh, part of the probably the northernmost extent of their range, um, all the way to Elantra Peak um, in the south, which is uh, bordering the Mojave Desert, about 320 miles south of, of Friel Peak. And then over to the White Mountains and actually um, up northwest of Bridgeport in the Sweetwater Range, that small cirque um, near Bridgeport. So, I do have some preliminary results uh, of this work, uh, density and occurrence. Um, and I'm gonna show you several figures sort of of the same flavor. These are binomial linear models. So um, that means that these are, uh, mo these are uh, models that show you whether uh, rosy finch is present or not. So at the top on, on the Y axis where we have occurrence, so a one represents a bird that is present, a zero represents a bird that is absent. Um, and all the, all the uh, figures that I'm gonna show you have uh, the same Y axis and the uh, X axis, the regressor uh, changes a little bit and I'll, I'll walk you through them. But my point of, is to show you that, um, rosy, is it, my point is to show different uh, attributes that affect rosy finch occurrence. So in this one, this is modeling elevation and really my point in showing this one is really, is that rosy finches, you can see at the top there, you don't start to see rosy finches until about 3000 meters. And um, 3000 meters in the Sierra is basically the elevation that is defined by Alpine. So this is just kind of um, a statement that provides uh, a window to say, yes, rosy finches occur in the Alpine and not uh, lower than the Alpine. So in, in subalpine and, and uh, conifer dominated forests. Uh, further talking about conifers, this is a uh, similar figure. This shows the percent conifer cover. So those habitat characteristic features that I showed you before in a previous slide when we measure the percent cover of all the different habitat types, conifer was one of them. And you can see here the occurrence um, of rosy finches really dissipates as you get more conifer percentage. So you can see up in the top right corner between zero and 10% percent conifer is when we see kind of the most frequency of rosy finches. And then after that, it really dramatically drops off. Um, so there's something going on there. Woody vegetation represents this lower elevation, this, this ecotone, this margin of where rosy finches do not occur. And then cliffs. So cliffs, like I mentioned, are a proxy for uh, nesting habitat. And what this graphic is showing is that the occupancy decreases um, when you move away from cliffs. So the further that you get away from cliffs, the less rosy finches that you see. And you can see that there's a concentration about 500 meters where occurrence is more prevalent. And after that, it gradually drops off. Um, and our sample size here is over the three years of 609 uh, total birds, total rosy finches. And then we see a similar trend with snow. So snow is a, a primary uh, food, a food source and any of you that have seen rosy finches 
you probably see rosy finches hopping around on the snow pecking at insects. So this is a big one um, and uh, not as prominent as cliffs, but similar uh, trend. We see that when you increase the distance away from snow patches, you see uh, a decrease in rosy finch occurrence. And again, right about 350 to 400 meters is kind of where the frequency drops off here. And then water, uh, similar trend. Um, and uh, it happens about at the same distance, about 400 to 500 meters, we see a drop off in water. And this is an interesting one because um, this is just modeling the Sierra Nevada um, what I did not include in this model is uh, occurrence of rosy finches in the White Mountains. And um, part of that is I, I've, I'm going to look into that further, but if you've been up to the White Mountains, you know there's not a whole lot of water. There is water in the form of snow melt, but there's not a lot of standing water, if any, um, not at least similar to these alpine lake basins that we have in the Sierra. So that's kind of an interesting dynamic that I, I plan to explore further. Okay. So. That first part is kind of getting at density and distribution. So in order to determine density, you first have to figure out where these birds are and what the constraints are. And now I want to talk about um, what else I'm interested in looking at. And this is uh, how reliant are rosy finches on snowpack for breeding, for the breeding season. So chick grain, food, et cetera. I am interested in how California's declining snowpack and affect rosy finches food sources at the top of the Sierra and, and White Mountains. And my aim is really to determine the relative importance of these food items in the rosy finch diet and how the diets, <clears throat> how the diet might change over time and over the breeding season. So rosy finches are omnivores and their diets consist of insects and seeds, both of which are made available by persistent snowpack. Um, many of the protein rich insects that are available during the critical early life stages of breeding are only available on snow, which are from lower elevations and trapped on the surface. Additionally, precipitation in the form of persistent snowpack is the primary source of water for plant food, <clears throat> plant growth, and seed production in the alpine environment. And as snow melts, seeds become more available. And rosy finches, if you've seen them, they tend to eat on the margins of snow quite a bit as snow melts out in these uh, alpine basins. Um, and there was a study in the Alps that found that a, a finch species with a similar life history is, is reliant actually on snowpack and it is the primary food source. So this has some credibility in looking into here in the Sierra Nevada. So, uh, my question, how reliant are rosy finches on snowpack for the breeding season as, as a food source? So I, I do have a hypothesis on this, that, that the diminishing snowpack, diminishing persistent snowpack, I should say, will directly influence the aeolian invertebrate abundance. And aeolian invertebrates, aeolian is a fancy word for windblown insects. Um, um, and how will this influence the alpine food webs important for breeding rosy finches? So, um, it's kind of a cool picture you can see on the bottom there, rosy finch, and all that, all those dark colored specks, those are all insects that are stuck to uh, the snow in those sun cups, and that's on the top of White Mountain there. And um, if you've been in the Sierra and seen these snow patches and you've walked around them, you've probably seen this phenomenon. And especially when you get into late June, you start getting into July when the northwest winds sort of pick up and you see a lot more insects sticking to the snow. And you'll see rosy finches hopping around and eating them. So my objective with this study is to I want to I'm going to use the tool of stable isotopes to determine the relative contributions and potentially the origin of food resources found in rosy finch diet. So in order to do this, I'm going to kind of explain what what isotopes can tell us about diet. So carbon isotopes. So carbon isotopes. That's a delta symbol, delta 13. They basically show the primary production source. So a lot of times uh, plant, seed, plant foods that are responsible for energy that flow through an ecosystem. And the transfer of carbon from one organism to another, another so the trophic levels, usually remains relatively the same. Um, so that, that, is a, that is a, carbon isotopes are commonly used for um, determining food and diet of, of organisms. Nitrogen um, is commonly paired with, with carbon 
and it kind of does something pretty unique. It actually indicates the trophic level position of organisms reflective usually in the tissue samples that were taken. So in birds, this would be in blood um, or feathers. Um, so you can kind of see the trophic position is what, what is eating what, essentially, you can find out. And that level of nitrogen builds up with larger organisms. And then hydrogen isotopes, <clears throat> um, often paired with oxygen, but hydrogen isotopes on their own um, kind of have two ways they can tell us about uh, tell us about diet or be used as a tool to uh, deconstruct diet. One is their really useful tracer of land to water or water to land nutrient flow. So hydrogen, I, hydrogen is in everything. Um, and you can separate out, uh, say, a, a aquatic uh, food source from a terrestrial food source based on the types of water, the origin uh, of water. And then something that's been done with migratory species and not really done too much with diet is you can actually infer the geographical origin by measuring the hydrogen in key body tissues. And how that's done is hydrogen, as it moves up in altitude, hydrogen has these, <clears throat> this, the heavy parts of hydrogen basically fall out as they move up in altitude. So you can actually tell the difference between where something comes from based on the weight of the hydrogen where you find it. So in high altitude systems like the one I'm in, um, for instance, I might be able to look at hydrogen isotopes in food items like insects with uh, rosy finch tissue samples like blood and determine are those insects local to that area or are they coming from lower elevations like what I've talked about before insects that are potentially blown up from uh, lower elevations probably the central valley and the agricultural lands and then deposited on snow. So my study will be building on a previous study similar to a study <clears throat> similar to a similar study that it was done on rosy finches in the Sierra um, uh, dissertation work by Peter Panchin out of Santa Barbara. Um, and what he looked at is the influence of mayflies as a major subsidy. So mayflies are this aquatic macroinvertebrate that hatches at this pulse in the summer. Um, and rosy finches eat them. And he was looking at how much of a subsidy is this for rosy finches in lakes where there is trout and trout have been stocked versus lakes that don't have trout. Because um, you can imagine uh, lakes, with lakes with trout have a lower abundance of mayflies than lakes without the trout. So looking at how that might affect uh, rosy finch diet overall. And he showed that mayflies are an important food source and, and it is suggestive that the depletion of this resource by non-native trout may have had the population level effects on rosy finches. So he did this study in Humphreys Basin um, and I thought it was a pretty cool study and I wanted to extend this out to uh, the White Mountains as well in a place that <clears throat> has, uh, has similar food resources, but in a very, very different system. So I'll kind of explain this. This is a mixed model from his study. And uh, really, I just want to highlight a couple of points here. Um, and so his, he did a study in 2005 and 2006. And what he found is that in both years, uh, carbon-13 and carbon-15, so remember what I talked about, these are, the, these are generally uh, analyzed together. And one is sort of giving you what the primary, what the primary source of food is, and the other one is giving you that trophic level. Um, that these signatures of a rosy finch tissues were immediate, immediately in between all the three food sources. So you see in the 2005 in pink, you see that uh, rosy finches there in the middle. And then over on 2006, they're in red, you see them in the middle. And what this graph is showing you is that they are basically smack dab in the middle, separated out very nicely in between all of these different food items, terrestrial seeds, mayflies, this aquatic subsidy, and then aeolian insects or windblown insects. So that's showing you that they basically are, are uh, getting, we're getting traces of these food items within rosy finch adults and within uh, juveniles. And what's pretty interesting about this graph is, uh, well, a couple of things. One is mayflies. So the way this graph works is uh, as you go up in ax, if you go up in the axis, so that's to the right for carbon and that's up in nitrogen that's an increasing level of that signature. So for carbon, we see this mayflies way out on the right. And that is basically a function of uh, mayflies being 
in an aquatic system and have a higher carbon isotope signature from say a terrestrial seed, which you see uh, further off to the left. And then what's more interesting um, to me is the aeolian insects that are way up high um, in, in, a, in nitrogen. And remember I talked about this being a trophic uh, event and aeolian insects aren't by themselves uh, like a predatory insect that would be eating a bunch of these other things, therefore being high in nitrogen. Um, so this is likely an artifact that they fed on fertilized crops in the Sam King Valley and have this really spiked increase of nitrogen from, from these crops. Um, so that is something that's kind of sparked my interest in looking and taking this a little bit further and using hydrogen isotopes. So what I would be doing is something like this, but adding hydrogen and hydrogen would essentially be giving a origin of where these insects are coming from specifically. So my goal is to take this step further and find out what is the influence of snow on these diet sources and how is this different between the mountain ranges where the habitat characteristics are very different, right? Sierra Nevada systems are generally uh, dominated by these uh, large lake basins, these dramatic lake, lake basins and scattered water. And the White Mountains are pretty depleted of uh, water at all, but they do have snow. And this picture illustrates this quite well. This is at the very top of White Mountain. And if you've been to the top of the White Mountain in the summer, you know on that northeast side of the peak there, there's always a snow patch, or I shouldn't say always, but a very persistent snow patch. And if you go up there in July, late July, <clears throat> it'll be the only place you see rosy finches eating. Um, you'll see them kind of on the tundra and moving around, but they're generally only actually eating on the snow. So what, I would, what I'm really interested in knowing is how much of the windblown insects are in their diet and how much of their diet is from terrestrial versus aquatic systems. Um, so you can think of this, the snow is kind of underlying this whole thing. And it is the, it is the one, it is the one main characteristic that we find in both mountains. And the snow acts as this giant sticky trap essentially for all these windblown insects. So what I'm really interested in knowing is with snowpack diminishing, does this giant sticky trap also as it's diminishing, does it also take away a primary food source? Um, and that's something that uh, Peter Panshin didn't, didn't get at in his work, but I think has set it up nicely for um, discovery of, of what that looks like. So I'll kind of quickly go over this. Um, how we go about doing this, the methods. So in 2019, I established a couple of uh, sites to collect birds from <clears throat> or capture birds from and analyze these, these isotopes. I collected uh, I collected feathers and blood, so tissue samples in the form of feathers and blood. And I'm using whole blood to look at these little windows of what they're eating. And the reason I'm using whole blood and not feathers is feathers represent a longer sample. They represent the last time they molted. So rosy finches generally uh, do a full molt after the summer, late summer into the fall. So any food items that I would be comparing to rosy finches through feathers would give me what they ate for the whole year. Whole blood, on the other hand, is the window is, is weeks. And weeks is really nice for me because weeks, when I caught these birds, they were, uh, they were essentially just starting to feed fledglings. And so what that gives me is the idea of what they have been eating since they've been on the nest um, to the time that they're actually feeding their chicks. And this is a short video so you guys can see what this looks like trapping birds. So I set these traps up. It usually takes me a couple of days to get these birds uh, familiar or trap happy. And that's what I have here. I have these traps pinned open, supply them with sterilized sunflower seeds. And you can see that, you know, they're charismatic little birds and I'm standing, I don't know, a meter away filming this. Um, they don't seem to care. And the way I do this, yes, yeah, I just, I get them trap happy. And then, um, and then I, uh, and then I close the doors and I'm able to capture them. And so in order, I also need to collect their food items. So what we do is we go and we collect, you can see here, we're getting uh, invertebrates off the snow. We're getting uh, aquatic, and aquatic mayflies from lakes. And then we're also collecting terrestrial food items. And we aren't just going out and collecting random samples. We were making observations on what rosy finches eat directly and going and, and uh, collecting food items that we see them eating. 
And then once we capture the birds, um, this is a whole event. We go, I go through it and uh, besides, taking, besides banding the birds and taking a bunch of morphological measurements, I also extract blood. Um, and then I put it on this, you can see in the middle picture here, I put it on this uh, uh, microscope slide, let it dry out in a dry alpine environment, scrape it off and then put it in a vial to um, look at later. So it's quite the process. And uh, this is a little video just to show you guys what it's like. This is on the top of uh, White Mountain Peak. And, um, and uh, you can see that, you know, working in this climate, this is a variable climate and working, working in this environment is not always an easy thing, but it is an exciting and fun thing. And uh, Carl in the background there is basically watching the storm come in and uh, as we are sort of hastily taking samples of birds while we're up on the mountain. Great, so um, like I said, this is something that I'm just getting into and I actually have sent those samples off to uh, New Mexico to get analyzed um, at an isotope lab there from a committee member that I have, Seth Newsom. Um, so I don't have those samples, but um, I wanted to tell you kind of just where we're at right now. So Alpine, we know after looking at this stuff for the last three years, I know that Alpine features may be co-limiting where rosy finches are in the Sierra and White Mountains. So these, this combination of effects of the distance to cliffs for nesting sites, snow and water for foraging resources, none of them by themselves are affecting where we find rosy finches, but together they are co-limiting where rosy finches might be. And we know that these habitat characteristics influence, um, have, have an influence. And, and I know this because many of our alpine transects didn't have rosy finches. So there was a plenty of places um, that we went, I think we had about a 60, an average of a 60 to 65% occupancy rate. So there is, there is something going on there. And then finally, we know that climate is changing and in a predictable way, and that snowpack is diminishing in California. But what we don't know yet is uh, the fate of the Sierra Nevada rosy finch. And hopefully what we find out with my study is that uh, snowpack is the underlying mechanism in all of this. Um, it is a predominant alpine feature and one that, um, I think rosy finches might be, uh, be um, tied to in one or another. And with that, um, I'd just like to thank folks, my advisor, all the crew from Doris Duke and Camino, and then of course, Natural Reserves who have uh, granted me uh, some money to do this research, as well as Yosemite and Sequoia Kings Canyon have provided some funding, Fish and Wildlife and um, Audubon um, in Southern California. Okay, thank you, Tim. That was great. Um, and for those of you on the call who have questions, um, I'm gonna invite you to uh, type your questions into the Q&A box, or you can also raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question out loud. Um, and Tim can follow up with you on any questions you guys have. So, I'll just wait and see if there's any questions. While we're waiting for questions, I actually do have one because I, I mean, learned a lot on this talk, Tim. And I just want to sort of get your impressions as to, um, you know, with climate change, as the snowpack diminishes, what are your predictions for the rosy finches in these habitats? And, you know, do you guys, actually see any food resources that are available to the rosy finches outside of the snowpack or is are they pretty dependent upon that snowpack you know it's really hard to pin down like i said they are a generalist and they seem to kind of do whatever they want um, which is really hard to get at what i do know is that they preferentially eat on snow especially in the early season and that as the snow melts out they definitely um, start looking at the margins, um, probably for soft seeds and trapped bugs. Um, I think it, in some ways it makes sense. The snow is this giant sticky trap. It's also white and it provides a great level of visibility for insects. So it's kind of easy targets in the early, in the early part when, this, when the winds pick up and those insects get deposited for rosy finches to, to, um, to get their, their food source from there. And then 
you know, from an energetics perspective, um, you know, insects are high in lipids and protein. So um, it makes sense to kind of front load on those resources when they're um, getting ready and, and rearing chicks. Okay, do we have any questions out there? Type them into the box if you guys have any questions. Should I stop sharing screen so I can see the box or how does? Yeah, you can do that. Okay, there we go. So we do have some comments in the chat. Fascinating, good luck with your continuing research and mentoring youth. And I do have to say that now that I see your pictures, Tim, I want to be on your field crew. <laughs> and go <up> there. <laughs> well, you're, you're welcome anytime. We got some spots that are uh, right behind your station. So yeah, nice. Okay. Couple of questions rolling in. Okay. Are there any other birds that nest that high? Uh, no, there are not any other birds that nest as high as rosy finches. There are birds that nest in alpine areas. Um, uh, there are dark-eyed juncos that kind of push up into the lower elevational bands. There are mountain bluebirds. Um, there are uh, American pipits. Um, those tend to be more where there's vegetation. But the rosy finches, they nest in cliffs. Um, and they nest high up in cliffs. And what's really fascinating about rosy finches actually as a complex, there's three total species in, uh, in, the, United, in the United States. And there's actually only been 27 nest sites ever recorded. Um, and that's, that's a product of how hard they are to find. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so another question, would we ever expect to see any rosy finches in Mammoth Lakes? In Mammoth Lakes, I hope not. Um, but I will say that, yes, you might see them in the winter. Um, you might see them right now. I don't know what they're doing right now. I will be in Mammoth Lakes this weekend um, to find out. Um, I'm curious with a low snow year, 15% snowpack, what the rosy finches are doing. I have um, an inkling that they might be moving up high early. And to get up high, you've got to move through Mammoth Lakes. Yeah. So uh, another question, has the escalator to extinction claimed any species in the Sierra Nevada thus far? No, it hasn't. And the escalator to extinction model came out of the tropics, that uh, figure that I showed early in the slide. The reason why uh, this, this has been modeled more in the tropics because tropical species are more defined to these thermal niches. Temperate climates, the species have a little bit more tolerance. Um, so it's more of kind of a bellwether event here, like in the temperate climates, we don't really know what's going to happen, but at the rate of climate change and in the location that it's at these high elevation sites, it's something that we have seen in tropical environments that could very well happen in temperate climates. Uh, so it seems like your preliminary observations meet your expectations. Have you had any surprises? Um, no, but I haven't analyzed the data from the White Mountains and the White Mountains are so much different and there is a robust population up there, I think. I don't know, I haven't quantified the population, but there's a ton of rosy finches up there and there's really no water. So um, there's something else going on and I don't know what it is and I'm really curious about it. Um, so I, yeah, I don't know yet. So uh, I'm just going to follow up with my own question on that, like how much gene flow is there between the Sierra and the Whites? So that is something I couldn't have, I didn't have time to talk to. So I have a bunch of side projects going on and one of them is looking at some evolutionary traits um, and working with the Bird Gene Escape Project out of Colorado, getting actually uh, blood samples and, and they are gonna complete the genome. Um, those mm -hmm. results are still not in. So that's pretty cool. Something that I'm trying, that I'm really interested in with um, this genetic stuff that you just mentioned is some morphology traits. And this is a finch. So of course I've been measuring beaks like crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, rosy finches have this really cool, and I think it's probably an adaptation to flying in cold weather, snowy weather. They have these little uh, rictal bristles or these tufts of hair over their, over their nostrils. That's pretty uncommon um, with songbirds. 
Um, so they have all these really cool, I think, adaptations. I can't say for sure. Like I said, not a lot of people have studied rosy finches. Mm -hmm. So it's something that I'm interested in, something that I'm taking measurements of. So when I have that bird in a hand and they're really hardy species, I can actually have time to take all these measurements and, and maybe find out some answers to those questions. Hmm. Cool. Um, so next question is, uh, what is your favorite field site? <laughs> Oh man, oh, I have so many. I really love that uh, the Ritter Banner um, transect. I love the Thousand Lakes region, even though it's a very popular region in the Sierra, it's absolutely gorgeous. The hike out there is amazing. And uh, an excuse to go hike and basically hike and climb up Ritter Banner is uh, pretty, pretty awesome. Nice, yeah, mm -hmm. beautiful spot. So uh, given what appears to be the inevitably increasing lack of snow, is there anything that can be done for rosy finches and other alpine organisms like picas? Well, the first thing that I'm trying to do is, you know, in order to, in order to have a management plan and a conservation plan, you really need to know how many species are there and where are they. So that's the first step. Um, that's been done with picas, and I don't know too much about picas, um, but I think that picas and rosy finches and these obligate breeders, the obligate alpine breeders do have a window into understanding, um, you know, what are the, what are the needs of these species and what, what can we do to conserve them? So um, really got to find out what are their habitat constraints. Right. All right. So two more. Um, one is there, will there be a chance to research what the finches do during the winter, where they migrate to, where they exist, and when they're not in the Sierra, the White Mountains, um, do they stay there all year long? Like what, what goes on in winter? That is a great question. It's a little bit of a black box. Um, one thing that bird ecology has is a robust citizen science uh, involvement. And uh, so, there, so there is some information out there on uh, eBird and stuff like that on where rosy finches go. Um, we do know that they're altitudinal migrants. So we do know that they don't, you know, go these long distances to migrate in the winter. We do know that they go down slope. We just don't know the frequency of that. And we don't particularly know where exactly they go. There's been some reports of them heading to people's backyard bird feeders, you know, in Carson City, some of these Eastern uh, Sierra towns. And then also um, there's been some reports of them going into like, you know, old mine shafts and stuff like that. So they're fairly local. Hmm. Okay. All right, and then finally, uh, kind of related to the genetic questions, are there any traits that separate the Sierra Nevada subspecies from the other subspecies? Um, any trait, let's see, are there any traits that separate the Sierra Nevada subspecies from the other species? Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's basically size of wings, size of the tarsus or the leg, little mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. All right, well, last one, um, Annie says, thank you, Tim uh, and Carol. <laughs> Great to learn about this. Appreciate the seminar and Tim's research and looking forward to seeing you, Tim, and your crew at Snarl and Valentine this season. So definitely on that note, I just wanna say, um, finally, Tim, we really um, appreciate all the great work you're doing and uh, look forward every year to you guys coming back, you and your your undergrad crew, because I think in addition to the science you're doing, like the mentorship you're providing to these students is really great. So we appreciate that and uh, look forward to seeing you. Thank you. I look forward to be hosted at Snarl. It's always a great place to stop over. Okay. Thanks, Tim. Good night, everyone. All right. Enjoy Colorado. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Good night.